Okay, let's do it. Okay, so I'm Gavin uh, from Terminus TV, and I'm going to speak a little bit about the language Esperanto, which is a, a language that hoped to be a universal human language. And in fact, Esperanto actually comes from the, the Indo-European word, uh, es I can't remember which it is. It's from Latin though, but it means to hope. And the the uh, O at the end is a noun, so it's like, it's hope in a universal language. It makes sense with Esperanto. So um, this here is uh, Zamenhof. And Zamenhof grew up in uh, Bialystok, and he saw lots of ethnic tensions between Poles, Belarusians, Lithuanians, uh, Russians, and, and, uh, and, and of course, Jews, of which he was one. Uh, so he was a polyglot. He had, he, because of growing up in Bielostok, it was a very uh, cosmopolitan area with lots of different uh, ethnicities and lots of languages, and he learned lots of them. So he, he, was a, he was a massive polyglot. He knew loads of languages, including Latin, French, Russian, uh, uh, Polish, and others. And so he decided that uh, what he wanted to do is bring people together. He, he thought a lot of these conflicts uh, originated in inability to communicate. So he wanted to bring people together with a universal language. So his first uh, con lang one of the other languages he knew was Yiddish. Uh, of course, he was a native Yiddish speaker. And so his first attempt was to create a regularized and uh, simplified Yiddish. And he thought that would be a pretty good basis because it shares roots with Slavic languages, uh, Semitic languages, and uh, Germanic languages. So a lot of times people say uh, Yiddish is basically a, a funny German. And it is, except the syntax is actually very Slavic. So it's a Slavic syntax. So many Yiddish scholars believe that it was originally a Slavic language. And in fact, uh, it has a, a fair few number of Hebrew words as well. But they, those seem to have been added later. So uh, they, they came in even potentially after the German, uh, which is also interesting. So he had a, a theories of ling linguistic relativism, uh, which are now often called the Sopper-Whorf hypothesis. Uh, so anybody who studied linguistics has probably run into the Sopper-Whorf hypothesis. And that's that um, the idea is basically that it's easier to if it's easier to say something in a in a language, then it's easier to think it because it's sort of less. Well, there's a strong supper war hypothesis and a weak one. The weak one is, I think, quite um, uh, realistic, and that that's like if it computationally expensive for you to think an idea, then you're less likely to think it. The strong supper war hypothesis is almost certainly untrue. That's that you can't think it unless you have the right words for it. Uh, but humans are very inventive, and you can always make complex concepts by composition. And languages are very compositional, so I don't think that's very realistic. The, this idea um, appeared to have a big impact on Samenhof, uh, leading to his own strategic uh, theory of how to produce a language. So here's a quote uh, from from him. And yet, though language is the prime motor of civilization, and to it alone we owe having raised ourselves above the land of other animals, difference of speech is a cause of antipathy, nay, even of hatred between people, as being the first thing to strike us on meeting. Not being understood, we keep aloof, and the first notion that occurs to our minds is not to find out whether the others are of our own political opinions or whence their ancestors came from thousands of years ago, but to dislike the strange sound of their language. So you can see there quite clearly some of his motivations for the construction of one of the world's first uh, constructed languages. So Samenhof was studious about uh, recording his language um, enthusiasts. He, so he, he constructed this language and then began promoting it and then was extremely sort of diligent in, in keeping notes on who was using it and conversing with them and sending letters. And uh, he had amassed about a thousand uh, speakers by the turn of the century, by uh, about uh, 1900. 
and the majority, about 900 of them, were in Russia. So it was quite popular amongst uh, the professional middle class, uh, learned utopian uh, idealists in urban areas. So it's, it tended to be liberals uh, in urban areas, relatively wealthy people. Um, but they, they really, uh, Russian, Russia, especially their elite, had a sense of inferiority with respect to Europe. Uh, they really wanted to be European and but felt like Russian is quite distant as far as Indo-European languages go from other Indo-European languages. And so it's quite hard. Uh, and they had to study quite hard in order to, to learn uh, French primarily, uh, but also German in order to feel European. And the feeling of inferiority was a, a really big driver here because they, they the, the sense was that Russia was a backwater, almost barbarian, somewhat Asiatic, and they all had a, a sort of a, a feeling of, of that really viscerally. And you see that in a lot of the politics of Russia from, a, from about the 18, the, the early, well, all the way back to the, to the 17th century. But, but it really, it, it, it acquires even more motive force in the 19th century. So um, in 1908, uh, they founded uh, an organization called the UAE, the, the uh, uh, I can't remember what the, uh, what, it, what it stands for. I think it's the Universal Association of Esperanto. And it was uh, explicitly neutral on politics uh, and that was in some way a response to Samenhof, who, who wasn't particularly neutral about politics. And it was formed by a group around a guy named Hector Hodler. Uh, and it wanted to have a unitary international membership organization. So it was really a very internationalist in flavor. And the organization man managed to spread uh, Esperanto very effectively into the rest of Europe. So it, it didn't remain just the backwater in Russia. It also uh, spread throughout Europe. The demographic of the spread was very similar to the demographic spread in Russia. So it would be um, middle class and upper class uh, liberals that had a sort of cosmopolitan uh, understanding and wanted to have better communication with other Europeans. Um, but from there, it starts to bleed into other groups. Um, there was even an Esperanto hall in Belfast, if you can believe it, uh, just at the beginning, somewhere around 1908, 1909, founded. What, so, uh, what, yeah. Was it was it Protestant Esperanto or Catholic Esperanto? It, it was it was Protestant Esperanto, as you <laughs> might imagine. It was the middle class. It would have been people, you know, of the ilk of you know uh masons and and such you know uh so very much a protestant sorry I, for for other listeners that that is a reference to an old northern irish joke about yes. the uh, jewish guy who goes along and uh, goes to northern ireland and uh, somebody asks him well what religion are you and he says i'm jewish and then the person says back to him, well are you protestant jewish or catholic <laughs> jewish uh, yeah i guess it it's not necessarily easy for people outside of Ireland to <laughs> to understand how how really funny that actually is. <laughs> it's not possible to not be on either side of that divide. Even today, it's hard. Um, so, but at, at around the same time at the foundation of the the hall in Belfast, uh, it it begins to spread into the workers' movement and especially. Uh, syndicalists and anarchists. So in the Harp in April 1908, Connolly, James Connolly, wrote, I do believe in the necessity and indeed the inevitability of a universal language, but I do not believe it will be brought about or even hastened by smaller races or nations consenting to the extinction of their language. Such a course of action, or rather of slavish inaction, would not hasten the day of a universal language, but would rather lead to the intensification of the struggle for mastery between the languages of the great powers. On the other hand, a large number of small communities speaking different tongues are more likely to agree upon a common language as a common means of communication than a small number of great empires, each jealous of its own power and seeking its own supremacy. 
So Connolly viewed it as a potential protective of smaller languages and smaller nations while facilitating universal uh, communication, which he obviously viewed as very beneficial uh, as Connolly did actually travel quite a bit and was quite cosmopolitan. Since Connolly is said to, he, it, it is said that Connolly was a speaker of Esperanto. So that's probably what he's referring to in this article in the harp, or he had learned of it recently during that time period. Uh, whether or not Connolly actually sp spoke of Esperanto, I'm not sure, but that that certainly it has been the implication from some historians. So, during and after World War One, uh, Esperanto has increasing influence in the workers' movement. Uh, in 1921, we see a, um, the formation of the Senatia Asocio uh, Tutmunda, which is the non-national uh, association of the world, of the whole world, uh, which is formed. The organization was founded by a guy named uh, Eugene Lanti, who learned Esperanto on the Western Front during the war. So uh, anybody who knows about the World War I knows that uh, much of your time is spent in uh, trenches, uh, being bored out of your mind, followed by short stints of being killed. Um, so they, they had interesting, uh, quite a lot of things were written or studied while in the trenches. Wittgenstein actually wrote his uh, Tractatus while he was in the trenches as well. The etymology of the organization's name, uh, Sinatsietsa, followed uh, Eugene's idiosyncratic anarchoid ideas. So he, he was a sort of anarchist, and so he wanted something that wasn't just uh, non-national, as I translated it there. It's actually anti-national. So he was sort of an anti-nationalist. Uh, the, the SAT, uh, this, this organization, attracted a lot of uh, syndicalists and anarchists, but then like, subsequently like, members like, of the huh. Social Democratic Party of Germany uh, the com and, and yeah. the, the uh, Social Democratic Party. Your, your mic is on so we can hear you. Sorry about that. The Social Democratic Workers' Party of, um, of Austria, which were very large, like um, sometimes hard to remember. At the time, political parties generally had very few members until the workers' movement. And then uh, groups like the SPD in Germany ended up having absolutely mass parties and it was only in response to that that the sort of groups like the christian democrats began to form subsequently because they would have you know the spd might have hundreds of thousands of members whereas uh you know other par political parties would have five thousand or something at its height in the late uh, 20s the sat said it had six thousand members uh, but its area of influence, the sort of periphery of that organization was much larger. So the SPD's own Esperanto organization alone had 35,000 members uh, and they had uh, club clubs where they would uh, study Esperanto that were littered all over Germany and Austria. Uh, so it became very popular there. Uh, they still have, um, they have a museum of Esperanto in Austria, which is a, a remnant of one of these clubs. Uh, so uh, also founded, of course, the, the Soviets, not to be outdone, wanted to have their own uh, parallel organization. They didn't particularly like the uh, anarchistic characteristics of uh, of the SAT. So they, in 1921, they founded the Soviet uh, Republicara Esperantista Union, and the Esperanto enthusiasts in the then uh, Republican Socialist Federation, or uh, the, the uh, Russian Socialist Federation of Socialist Republics, and the USSR were able to convince the state that the various different language troubles could potentially be overcome by having a language movement. So 
the, the Esperantists sort of convinced the Soviet bu bureaucracy that one of their problems, which was a very uh, sprawling state that had lots of different nationalities, that they could overcome it by instead of imposing Russian as the universal language by having another one that would be more uh, amenable to or that, that uh, the minor nations would, would feel less uncomfortable with. And this fit very closely actually with Lenin's uh, antipathy to Russification. So he, Lenin really d did think that uh, Russification would be uh, a negative uh, that's in contrast to some of the other Bolsheviks who, who were quite positive on the idea. So the organization was given state support and that really had a big impact. So um, now the, the relationship between the, the sort of anarchistic elements of the leadership of the uh, organization um, were, were always a, a source of trouble. And as we roll into the 1930s, uh, the paranoia, like the, the Soviets become absolutely paranoid going into the 1930s. Um, and not without reason. I mean, they, they were invaded eventually by the Nazis, but they, they were fearful of, of such a thing happening. And that's, that paranoia led to a lot of like negative consequences internally. Uh, I won't go into that, but people have probably heard of the purges. So the Esperantists in particular were deemed suspect uh, because it was considered to be an incredibly efficient language for spies. Uh, and if you learn, like I, you can learn to read Esperanto uh, in about six months, you could, you could be pretty good at reading a newspaper if you spend the time. So you can imagine how actually it would be a pretty convenient language for spies uh, because it wouldn't take you long to, to to master the language and then be able to communicate and have a pretext for going to a place and doing so. So uh, Esperantists uh, kind of kept on the down low during the purges. Uh, the organization was kind of destroyed, uh, but then after World War II, it came back uh, and held a conference in 1956 after the death of Stalin. However, it, uh, it never gained the status that it had known in the early period. So, and it, this, um, the language was not restricted entirely to Europe. It actually was very popular also with syndicalists in China um, because the Chinese were interested in new ideas. They also had a notion of uh, some, some sense of inferiority to the Western powers after having suffered uh, pretty severely under um, various different imperial conquests. And the, the intellectuals were very concerned about learning information. But of course, Chinese is even far more distant uh, from Indo-European languages than Russian. So it's quite difficult for, for people to transition between them. So one of the major exponents of Esperanto in China was this syndicalist pictured here who called himself Ba Jin. And uh, Ba Jin was uh, the, it's the first syllable of the name Bakunin, who was an anarchist, and the final syllable of uh, the name Kropotkin, who was also a Russian anarchist. So he's, he's named after uh, Russian anarchist princes, strangely enough. <laughs> so both of those anarchists were princes, which I, I also find kind of funny. Uh, so the, there's some interesting tracks actually that have been written that in the early in the 1920s uh, by Chinese, uh, largely Marxists or syndicalists that, that's written in Esperanto. Um, so that's kind of interesting because you can still go and read those and it's much more accessible to me, for instance, than, uh, than Chinese. So uh, this is a, a, a this is a quote from uh, Max Feinheit. Uh, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. And here you'll see it's it's written in Yiddish. So um, uh, <laughs> yeah, er spracht ein uh, Dialekt uh, mit ein Army ein uh, Plan. So that I guess that's what that means. I think it's yeah. Army and Navy. 
So you can hear it's, it's sort of similar to German, but it's written in very funny characters. Um, so as a movement, uh, Esperanto built about, uh, well, it built tens of thousands of speakers, probably 100,000 or so uh, during the height in the 1920s. And as the leadership of the USSR in the 1920s noted uh, concerning their own organization, it is not yet a movement. Uh, and that was probably its high point some, sometime in the 1920s. So it could have, uh, so the question is like, um, uh, could it have transformed into something that would actually go mass? And it seems to me that, uh, that you really need to have institutional power before you can actually translate language into mass space. So you have to have a bureaucracy that requires the use of the language before you see something actually, actually becoming a lingua franca, so to speak. So we know from a number of examples that pervasive use can happen uh, quickly if the language is adopted as the language of a bureaucracy. So um, one of the ways in which Islam managed to spread very rapidly was the requirement that um, being part of the political class required the learning of Arabic. And that spread the language, not just into the bureaucracy, but then eventually into the broad bases of the populations as well. Um, and you see in Israel also, they, they had like, nobody spoke Hebrew until very recently. The language was completely unspoken. Uh, you would learn some uh, Hebrew, uh, biblical Hebrew in order to uh, do a bar mitzvah, but nobody understood what it meant. And I think that that was fairly universal. I'm not exaggerating there. It was uh, th this new, the Hebrew that we speak today is not the Hebrew that, that uh, was spoken in the past. It's sort of an, it's actually a constructed language. And it's probably the most successful constructed language uh, that the world has ever known. So there were a number of pressures that allowed that. But part of that was the institutional uh, requirement that Hebrew be used for the bureaucracy. Now that wasn't a foregone conclusion on the on the foundation. Well, at the foundation of the state of Israel, it was, but the Jewish community in in um, in Israel, uh, going back into the 1920s, in fact, uh, it was not a foregone conclusion that Hebrew would be used at all. Uh, there were, in fact, big riots around the use of Yiddish in Israel uh, or in Palestine um, prior to the formation of the state where Hebrew speaking or Hebrew promoting nationalists attacked uh, any plays or uh, cultural events that had Yiddish to try to stamp it out. Okay. So uh, this, this graph, this is a graph, we're a graph database, so I thought you get to use a graph. This represents the, the number of translations that are required for eight different languages. So you can just imagine what the European Union looks like in terms of this thing. In actual point of fact, uh, it, it's, it's much more efficient to have a central language. So if you have one language, you can translate between all of these and you only have eight edges. Otherwise, the thing scales like n squared so the number of edges grows on the order of n squared. It's a bit less than n squared, but uh, it, it has the same uh, big O notation. So that obviously is a problem if you're trying to translate, like it, the European Union has a lot of difficulties with translation. It would make sense uh, from an efficiency perspective to just adopt one. Now, in, in, in practice in the European Union, lots of things just go through English. That's actually the secret uh, universal language of Europe is English and they hide it by translating via English into these various different languages. Yeah, I think exactly how it works in, in my yeah. experience is yeah. that everybody just translates to English and then you have English to Latvian, English to Italian. But yeah. English being the central point at which you translate them. That's right, because otherwise it becomes just completely unmanageable very quickly. I mean, with the eight, you can already see it's 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 madness. But yeah, I mean, in, in practice, they're they're kind of pretending that English isn't the universal central language, but it actually it is. 
Okay, so um, just another question. I mean, when people, when you're speaking of constructed languages, one of the funny thing about constructed things is because they're constructed, you can take issue with a lot of the features of the language uh, very quickly. So this happens in programming languages all the time. You're like, well, why didn't you do it this way? You should have done it that way or something like that. So one of the, one of the questions about um, Esperanto that people bring up is, is, is it Eurocentric? So you can see here, there's sort of a, a map of the world in terms of uh, what people speak in various countries. Uh, so Indo-European is actually very broadly uh, used. It's used over a large portion of the earth. But then there's also Sino-Tibetan, which obviously has a very significant population. And then you have the Turkic languages. And then you have all of the, um, the African uh, languages that there's, there's uh, two major families, the Niger Congo. And um, I can't remember what the, no, this is Semitic languages in the North, presumably. Um, so uh, it is absolutely uh, Indo-European or Indo-European centric. Um, colonialism has made Indo-European fairly widespread, though. However, it's also uh, much easier for, for instance, a Chinese person to learn uh, Esperanto than it is any other European language. And in China, it's actually the largest population of Esperanto speakers today is in China because it's used as a halfway house for teaching the structure of an Indo-European language without having to get bogged down in all of the irregularities that happen in the uh, in the actual native spoken languages. So it, it can serve as a useful halfway house uh, pedagogically. And it turns out that if you learn Esperanto for a year and then learn French, you actually progress in French faster than only studying French during that period, according to uh, some, some of the uh, uh, research that has been done in China on the question. So that's kind of an interesting fact. Uh, and it's also interesting that, that, that they're the largest uh, speaking uh, population at the moment. So uh, it seems like a, a world language for something like the UN could potentially be more worldly. Like if you wanted to have a constructed language that uh, felt, uh, you know, not like an imposition, like the sort of old Russification type uh, situation, you, you probably would want to use words and structures from uh, a greater span of languages. But uh, Esperanto is what it is. It was invented by a European who only knew, uh, well, only knew really European or Indo-European languages, even though he was massive polyglot. Yiddish is Indo-European, and, and as is Polish and all the other languages he spoke. <clears throat> So here's some uh, <laughs> here's some uh, important phrases in Esperanto. Um, so the first one, "Fantomo hantas en Europa, la fantomo de comunismo." I don't know if anybody recognizes that. You probably have yes. somebody. Yes, yes. The phantom is holding you in Europe. <laughs> the phantom of communism, the opening of the communist manifesto. That's right. Yeah. Spe yeah. Oh, exactly. Spectre. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, proletoi el ciu lando uh, unuiju. There's another one. That's, Workers uh, of, the, of all countries unite. That's right. And uh, ne, ulit, uh, ne utilas pendumi la bourgeon ili de nove crescas kiel trud herboi. And that one's maybe a little bit harder. Um, Something about the bourgeoisie. That is yeah. correct. That's right. So it's no use uh, hanging Ke the. Keel is war, right? They'll only what? Keel is war, is it? No, Keel is like how. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do, do, do our Esperanto speakers know what this is, Matthias and? Uh... I'm not a speaker. Oh, you're not. Mm -hmm. No. I'm, I'm just right. an enthusiast. <laughs> Yes. They, they'll only grow again, essentially, or they'll only uh, grow another head or something. I can't remember what through hair boy is. I can't remember. But that looks like, um, you know, internet speak. It's like, like Thunder Boy. 
<laughs> oh, it's it's weeds. I just looked it up there. So this is weeds. <laughs> yeah, the only grow again is weeds. That's uh, that's what the phrase is. Um, and that's uh, that's it. <laughs>